Hello, good afternoon and welcome to episode 62 of Talking Asperger's with Andrew. My name is Andrew Marsh and I have Asperger's syndrome. I was diagnosed uh, seven and a half years ago when I was 51 and everything fell into place. Everything started to make sense because I now had an understanding of why I was different. I've always known I was different, never particularly fitted in with family, at school, with, with some notable exceptions. Certainly not at college and, and sometimes at work. I didn't really fit in, felt different. And people behaved differently towards me, so they did to others. Got my diagnosis, everything fell into place. There's a reason. That's why I behaved in a certain way. And that's potentially why some people treated me in a certain way as well. So what I now do is I work with employers and people on the spectrum to help better manage people like myself, people who have Asperger's in the workplace. Because I think we have amazing skills. Um, we don't all have the same skills. When you've met one person with Asperger's syndrome, you've done just that. You've met one person with Asperger's. Just as um, neuro neurotypical people, when you've met one person, you've just met one person. The next person might be different, have different traits, different skills, different abilities. It's exactly the same with autistic people, people with Asperger's syndrome. We're all different. We all have our own uniqueness. We have some commonalities, just as neurotypical people do. And that's what one of the things I want to talk to you today about is some of the commonalities that people who have Asperger's syndrome exhibit. And today's topic is creativity. It's a good one. I like this topic because if you allow someone to be creative, if you allow them to think differently, to say, think out of the box a wee bit, or just, just say to someone who, if, if you're working with someone with Asperger's and you've got a tricky problem, say, how would you go about solving this? They might not have the answer, but they might have a strategy, uh, a way to tackle the problem. And we don't know for certain, but certain people throughout history, we think may have had Asperger's syndrome. You look at people like Leonardo da Vinci, Alan Turing, uh, Steve Jobs, Einstein, Newton, People like that who are incredibly creative, maybe Mozart and Beethoven. We don't know for sure, obviously, because we weren't around that day in those days to, to observe them, observe their behavior and, and, and so on. But really, when people have read their diaries and read their, 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 their writing and their, what they did and how they went about doing things, there's strong suspicion that some of those people may well have had Asperger's syndrome. And one of the things that we do is we like to ask the what if question. As I said earlier, I, I, I got diagnosed when I was 51. I had a career as a geologist before I knew I had Asperger's. And one of the things that I like to do is, is, is just to sit down when, tackle, when, when tasked with tackling something and say, okay, what do we know? That's always a good place to start. And sometimes it's, it's a step that gets overlooked. What do we know? What do we want to know and where's the gap? What, what, what's the gap between when we know and what we want to know without getting all Donald Rumsfeld on us? What do we want to know? What do we got to solve? What's the issue we have to fix? And I would just sit down and look at it and think, I need to know this, this and this, and I need to get to that point. I need to find a solution that deals with these points, A, B and C, one, two and three. And I would not be constrained by traditional thinking although to me it was it is traditional thinking because that's how i think i i don't think i'm going to think differently now because i have asperger's and i'm going to solve something i just allow myself to think ask the what if question what if we looked at this from this angle what if we challenged those assumptions that we knew what if we thought about this differently People like Alan Turing did exactly that. At the beginning of World War II, when he went to Bletchley Park, to uh, was given the task of cracking the German Enigma code machines from the high command and the U-boats. He didn't think, what, how do we solve this? Because there's, a, a multi, there's millions and millions of potential um, key codes, solutions. What they actually sat and worked out was, what options can't it be? And they had this machine, these machines that they produced that worked out, but tried to work out what the code wasn't. Now, you might think that's counterintuitive, but it's not. What the code isn't. If you rule all those out, 
you're left with a much smaller number, a smaller data set that you can put the code breaking specialist, the women who work at Bletchley Park, to try and crack those codes. They have a much smaller, rather than say, let's try and crack the, crack the code. We need to try and crack 100,000 options or whatever the number was today. We've got to do that today because they change it tomorrow. Let's try and eliminate 95,000, 99,000, so that we've got a smaller number to manually try and crack. And that's what they did. They took out what they knew it couldn't be and focused on what it might be. And that's how they cracked it. It's far more complicated than that, how they did what they did at Bletchley Park. But the point I'm getting trying to make is he thought differently. He didn't set the 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 specialists up, the, the code breaking ladies up and say, okay, you've got 40 to crack, you've got 40 to crack, you've got 40 to crack, or whatever the number was. They didn't say that because it's A, it's too overwhelming. It's too much for them to do. Let's focus them on what it might be, having ruled out what it can't be. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And Leonardo da Vinci, famous painter, he was so much more than a famous painter. He nearly discovered the circulation of the blood system throughout the human body a hundred years before Harvey. He was an engineer. He was a geologist. He was a, a anatom studied the human anatomy, and he, used, and he was one of the first people to dissect humans to study the muscle structure and the veins and the arteries and where everything. And he drew incredibly detailed drawings. If you check out one of his autobiographies or you could, uh, can check out his codexes online because he did them, but they're called his codex. You will see the detail and the skill with which he did his work. Truly a remarkable man. Not just a very, very, very good painter. But, but he would sit there and think, well, how can we do this? He sat one day, he was challenged with thinking, he did quite a lot for... Um, various barons or various warlords, I don't know, that's the wrong word, I can't think of quite the right word, but various political leaders from the different regions in Italy and elsewhere. And he did a lot of warfare work. And he came up with something that we now call a tank. But he came up with this enclosed structure that ran on wheels that you could fire arrows with, with bows and arrows from and harpoons out of. It's the precursor to the tank, 400 years before we had tanks, which we, we first really saw tanks in, in modern uh, setting in World War One. But he invented something like a tank that would become a tank. He invented flying machines. He invented a hang glider. Um, he, studied the, he studied the flight of birds to the point of obsession, how many times they flapped their wings. And he actually observed, I don't quite know how he did this, because some birds flap their wings very, very fast. But he observed that certain species of bird flap their wings faster on the downstroke than on the upstroke. Now, why would someone want to do that? Because he wanted to understand flight. By wanting to understand it, he studied it. And he looked for every possible angle on how flight works, what made flight work. And he invented a hang glider. He invented something that looked very much like a helicopter. The way that the um, circuit wings of this machine that he came up with worked. It was hundreds of years later before Skorsky developed the helicopter into its modern form. But he, he wasn't constrained by, this is what we know, so we're going to stick with that. And we'll see if we can improve it, tweak it a little bit. What do we want to solve? And his... His problem, what his salute, his, his, his situation was, how do we get men in a enclosed structure to a battle scene so that they're not hit by arrows and and so on, and they can attack? And he came up with the tank, what we would call the tank. Truly remarkable man, what he came up with, because he was not constrained by what we knew, what we now know. What do we want to solve? And he allowed his imagination to free think. He was a pioneer, a visionary, an absolute visionary. If you ever get the chance to read a biography of Leonardo da Vinci, I would highly recommend it. It's eye-opening. 
It's jaw dropping. It's amazing. I'm actually going to start rereading it again tonight because of what he came up with, what he tried to solve, what he attempted to uh, resolve. He came up with, if you look at it without knowing the scale, it looks like a crossbow. When you read the, 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 the text that goes with it, it's a crossbow that's 80 foot long. And its sole purpose was in warfare was to fire a very large uh, arrow more than an arrow, a javelin type uh, projectile at the gates of your enemy's castle to try and knock it down or thud embed the the arrow so hard into the into the door that you could then pull the machine backwards and pull the doors off so that you can then invade through the doors. 80 foot long this thing is. It's astounding the detail that he came up with. Brilliant. So I'm not saying everyone who has Asperger's syndrome has that level of brilliance. That's clearly not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that all of us, whether neurotypical or neurodivergent, have got abilities to think differently about how we do things. And certain people on the spectrum are very good at that. There are there's a company called Auticon who are a computer IT service provider. They are, have offices throughout the world. And every single one of their computer specialists, their IT specialists, has autism or Asperger's syndrome because they look, they search out and look for these people when they're recruiting. They have a unique series of tests that they, that they put potential candidates through to sift out those who are particularly good and skilled at IT and computing. Now, it's not my thing. I can work a spreadsheet quite well, but don't ask me to do macros. But some of them who are gifted numerically and coding and that are fantastic at what they do, and Auticon employ them. 80-85% of all Auticon employees are autistic or have Asperger's syndrome because they are so good at what they do and they support them project managers and team leaders who understand their abilities, understand what the client is looking for, and they marry the two together. Perfect. That is the model for how we should be doing business in the 21st century. I take my hat off to them. They are fantastic. Because they properly support those people in the right environment. They give them the training and then they let their skills do the rest. So people on the spectrum have the ability to do things and to do extraordinary things well, to think out of the box. They might come up with a new product, a new process, a more efficient process than the one that you're currently working on. If you're, if, you're, if you're a manufacturer and you've got seven processes in a line and they're all 90% efficient, you're losing a lot of efficiency, a lot of energy, consumption just to get to the end point with those seven pro processes they might they might be able to come up with, with taking two of those processes out combining two or three of those processes into one process that's immediately going to make you more, far more efficient cost you less energy your overheads are going to be less and the product that you produce at the end of it might be a better product they might have a better way of doing what you currently do or Take the Apple situation. Back in the day, we had Blackberries and Nokia 3310s or something very similar to that as the handheld device with which we communicated with each other when we were not face to face and didn't have a landline telephone available to us. That's how we did it. We had a handheld device, something like that. There were Motorola ones that were similar. But by, by that time, we had the power of the computer, which is what I'm sitting at now talking to you. Someone in Apple, and it may have been Steve Jobs, it may have been someone else, said, got a handheld phone, I've got a computer. What if we married the two together? And in a handheld device, you had the power of the computer. And at a moment in time, they changed how we communicate with each other around the world. It's, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that with their iPhone. They created something that
that had never been seen before and allowed us all to communicate with each other around the world. I can send a message to my friends in Australia and providing they're awake and want to return, they can send a reply back to me within seconds. Free of charge across the ether. Amazing. We can keep up to date with our social media and perhaps some of us spend more time doing that on our handheld devices than is, than is good for us or that we should do. We should be doing other things, but we can do all our social media on a handheld device. We can take videos, we can take photographs, we can do voice recordings, we can send messages anywhere we want to. Providing someone else has got a device that can receive it, we can send a message anywhere around the globe. Because they thought of the what if question. What if we combine the power of the computer with the handheld device? Amazing. So people on the spectrum, they have this, uh, some of them have this ability to ask those what if questions, to challenge the norms of what we know and think, well, what, what do we want to know? What, how can we solve this? What can we do that is different that we can improve on? They may come up with a new product new service, more efficient service, better way of doing something. They might come up with um, a small piece of software that makes your business 15% more efficient. Would you like to be 15% more efficient? Yeah, I bet you would in your business. They might come up with an accounting spreadsheet or a macro that can reduce the amount of time taken dealing with accounts for your clients or your own accounts. You would like that, wouldn't you? Of course you would. People on the spectrum have this, some of them have this ability to think about those situations. How can we do this better? What are we trying to achieve? Start off with what you're trying to achieve and what do we know now? And what can we take it to? Where can we take that? How can we extend that to do something bigger, better, more efficient, more cost-effective so that we can be the market leader we can be the trend. Rather than following what everyone else is doing, let's set our stall up. Let's be the market leader so that this product that we've just come up with will be in five years' time will be number one in our sector with this product. And we will lead the way. That's what you want your business to do. With the help of people who have Asperger's syndrome and autism, you can achieve that. Support them in the right way. I do a uh, a, a little talk around leadership um, and management and, and I draw the distinction between the two um, I do look on social media from time to time because it's a valuable source of information on employment and you can get uh, posts that are things like 21 things that made people quit because of bad bosses and trust me if you ever decide you want to do some research on that do a google or other search engines are available and just put in something like the worst bosses made me quit or um, bridezilla wedding nightmares or worst mother-in-laws in history or something like that whatever the topic is that you want to look at i look at situations around employment why i quit today because of my boss was so bad and you get you you read these reports this is in the we're in the third decade of the 21st century. Let's remind ourselves of that. We're in the third decade of the 21st century. You read these reports of someone who, who's, who's, who, whose bosses are insane. There's no other word to describe it. They're psychopaths. They've got clipboards and they're, they're, you're two minutes late coming in from work. I'm docking you half an hour's pay. What? I stayed late half an hour or an hour every night to get something done. That doesn't matter. You were two minutes late. Well, you, you know what's going to happen with that is the person who was two minutes late, first of all, they're not going to stay back every hour. If something isn't finished at the end of the day, down tools, go home. If the company isn't going to support me and understand that there was an accident on the motorway and I couldn't get in because the road was blocked. There was fire engines, there was ambulances, there was the police. We had two miles of traffic. Those sorts of things businesses have to accept happens. The people will make up the time as this, as people do. But you don't sit there with a clipboard and write them up for being two minutes late. If they're doing it every day, then have a word with them about their punctuality. But even then, two minutes. And you read about these amazingly insane bosses and why people had to leave and they, they, they resigned. And there was 
I'm going to give you an example of this one. This is, uh, there's two examples I want to give you. This first one happened in America at the back end of last year. A person who had social anxiety disorder, didn't like meeting people, didn't like being in groups and crowds and people like that. It was his birthday coming up and he said to, he said to his boss, I know when it's someone's birthday, you make a fuss and there's a cake and we go out for a, for a meal in the evening. And it's, I, I appreciate that as something that you do, but I don't want you to do it for me. I do not want anyone to pay any attention to this date being my birthday. I don't want a surprise. I don't want a party. I don't want a cake. Please don't do it. Guess what happened on his birthday? Yeah, they did. They had a surprise for him. They had a cake. The, the poor guy panicked as as he was bound to do and went and sat in his car to try and calm down the next day his boss and his boss and his boss's boss had a meeting with him to discuss the disciplinary action about his behavior yesterday and he had a panic attack and they sacked him you're sitting there looking at the computer and thinking i'm making this up i am not making this up this person went to see a lawyer. This was in the United States. Went to see a lawyer, sued them for wrongful dismissal. And guess what? The judge found in his favor. Said, he said, don't do it. You did it. He had a panic attack. And then disciplining them, he had another panic attack. What kind of employer are you? Found in the gentleman's favor, fined the company $450,000, about 400,000 pounds. And quite rightly so. Quite rightly so. I'm going to give you an example back home in the UK at the back end of last year. There was a lady who has dyslexia. She worked for one of the biggest retail companies in the country and one of the biggest brand names in the world, Marks and Spencer. This is public knowledge, so I'm not divulging anything that sh that isn't out there in the in the universe in the ether. And she had a system that when she sent emails someone would would check them for typing and typos because she couldn't see the typos something happened and mistakes were being made in emails whether the checking system hadn't wasn't happening or something or she had a new boss she'd been there 10 years so this is not a new employee been there 10 years and she was sacked she took them to court and she won she took them to court for wrongful dismissal. Because in the Equality Act of 2010, the company has to make reasonable adjustments to cater for anyone's situation. Just as, let's take an obvious situation, let's suppose you're in a wheelchair and there's not a ramp to get up the five steps to get into the building to go to work. That's not fair on the person in the wheelchair. So the company would rightly be criticized and potentially prosecuted for not providing a wheelchair, a wheelchair ramp for someone in a wheelchair. That's an easy thing to, 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 to resolve. So you have to make reasonable adjustments. And now that doesn't mean to say they have to go to the nth degree to cater for absolutely everything. It's called reasonable adjustments for a reason. And the reasonable adjustments were that someone read the emails and they were checked before they were sent out. For some reason, that's, that failed. And she was sacked for making mistakes in her emails. Now, all it needed was to her to have a colleague, whether it was her boss or not, but just a colleague to say, I've prepared this email. Could you go through it and check it for me, please? Now, emails tend not to be very long. I, two or three pages at the most. If it gets much longer, you'd send it as an attachment. But, but that can be catered for. You can, you can cater for that. And so the, where's the difficulty in having a member of staff available to say, yep, I can read that. Give me half an hour. I'll have a look through it. Check it with you, then I'll go over with you, and we can either either I can, I can either correct it myself, or I can tell you where the corrections are. We can sit down and go through it, and then everything's fine. If you did that as a word document, you then copy and paste it into email. Boom, job done. 
she was sacked for making mistakes in emails and other communications. And she sued them, quite rightly. And she won. What was going on at that situation in Marks and Spencer's, I don't know. But something clearly had failed. It is not difficult to support someone in the right way. What your supervisors and your managers should be doing, and coming back to the point I made a few minutes ago, is they should be leaders. They should be inspiring everyone to be the best at what they can be for the business, for the benefit of the employee. Because if you're doing great work and you're appreciated and you feel valued, guess what? You're going to you're going to get want to get out of bed and go to work on those cold, wet, horrible winter mornings. You're going to want to come into work because you're you're appreciated, you're valued, and you feel as though you're you're what you're doing is, is, is contributing to the success of the team, the success of the business. You want leaders who inspire you to do that. You want teams to support you in supporting you in the right environment. There was an interesting article I read at the back end of last year, which said. Properly supported, in the right environment, people with Asperger's syndrome are up to 140% more efficient than their neurotypical colleagues. Three things to take from that. Really important three things. Properly supported, in the right environment. Why wouldn't you support your staff to be the best that they can be? Why? And in the right environment, what, why? If if someone like me who has Asperger's has a sensitivity to light or noise, for example, don't sit me next to the printer that's going click, where boof, all day long. That can be very distracting, very agitating, can be very annoying, and can lead to overwhelm and meltdowns. So for me, find me a quiet place, preferably without strip lighting. Give me an angle poised light that I can sit on my desk. Perfect. Thank you very much. Other people have other sensitivities. I know. Um, I know a lady in 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 uh, who's uh, in in this industry. Um, she's sensitive to smells, and I can be. You know, if someone has really strong aftershave or strong perfume, can be very sensitive. So you know, don't put that person next to the door that leads to the canteen. Have a workplace for them different to that, so that they don't get the smells from the canteen, or they're not sat next to. The, the chap who has heavy on the aftershave or the lady who's heavy on the perfume. You can you can sort you can sort that out in a team environment. So the two two first key points, properly supported in the right environment. That's what your leaders should do. Then you've got the third part of that uh, piece of information. People with Asperger's can be up to 140% more efficient than their neurotypical colleagues. So why wouldn't you want to employ people who have Asperger's syndrome or autism because they can be more efficient because we tend not to like idle chit chat. So we're not going to be doing this, looking down at our phones all day because it's gone bleep. Oh, that's a Facebook message or it's a tweet or it's an Instagram or it's a something. Be focused on what they're doing. They will be focused on what they're doing doing the job that you've given them to do. Do it well, do it efficiently, excel at it. That's what they want to do. So properly supported in the right environment, etc. You should be doing that for all of your staff, not just your neurodivergent ones. But let's suppose, let's take another example. Let's suppose you've had a CV in from someone from Eastern Europe or Asia or South America. Their CV ticks all your boxes, absolutely nails it. You think, this is the person we want. You get to interview them, and you notice that their English isn't quite polished. They struggle. Would you employ that person or not? If everything else was perfect, I say you do. Because what you do is you give them a mentor to help them with their English, particularly their written English, if you've got reports and communications going outside, refer back to a previous example, and you would put them on a course, wouldn't you? You would put them on, if it needed to be a beginner's course or an intermediate or an advanced course, on English, on 
written, spoken and reading English. And if that needed to be 12 weeks or six months, you would do that, wouldn't you? If you've got your prime candidate in front of you, but they just needed some help with their English, you would do that, wouldn't you? Please tell me that you would. And if you wouldn't, please contact me and tell me why you wouldn't. Why you wouldn't have your ideal candidate just because you might have to adapt how you do things for three to six months while the, you get their English up to speed. If, if you wouldn't do that, please, please write and tell me why. I'd love to know why. I'd love to know your thinking behind turning down your ideal candidate just because their English isn't quite what you would expect it to be, what you want it to be at that time. And let's suppose, let's take another example. Let's suppose um, that person from South America that we were just talking about, and you said to them at an interview, we've got this problem. We don't know how to fix it. This, this, and this goes wrong, and that happens. And they're sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we fixed that in my previous company two years ago. Now are you worried that this person's English isn't quite as good? They can fix the problem that you've had for five years. They've got that knowledge right there. And they will share that with you on day one. You said you could fix this. Can you do it? Can you show us how you did it? Is their English a problem now? No. If you have to adapt what you do to take on the best people, then adapt. Companies that adapt to a neurodiverse workforce and a multidisciplinary workforce and a multicultural, multiracial, multilinguistic workforce, those are the ones that are going to survive. They won't just survive, they will thrive and they will be the leaders and they will be the trend and they will be the ones that everyone else follows. You want to make sure that that's you, that that's your teams in your business, in your company. Because you might employ the best people, but you're finding they leave after 18 months every, all the time. Why, did we, why, did we, why are we losing all these people after a year, 18 months? The best people are leaving because you're not supporting them in the right environment. You're being clipboard managers rather than leaders. And ultimately, people will vote with their feet. They'll say, sorry, this isn't for me. There's plenty of other companies out there. I want to share my expertise with them. They will give me the support I need. They will give me the promotional opportunities that I need. They will send me on courses that I need to develop my career and my professional expertise. So the good people will leave. And that next company will be the market leader and you'll be dragging behind. So creativity and supporting people in the right environment, allowing them to, sh to showcase their skills, to develop something new for your business, find a solution to a long-standing problem, develop a new product like the iPhone. Find out how to fix that problem, how to fix that glitch. They may be a spreadsheet whiz and can do a macro that can cut the, the time taken to fix, to deal with a, a load of data in half. You'd want that person to do that macro for you, wouldn't you, rather than your competition? So embrace neurodiversity. Embrace difference. Embrace anyone who is different, be that from a different country, different language, different ethnicity, whether they're neurodiverse. You might have someone. You, you might have a position that's... A that you need someone to help plan three teams of 20 people in each team. That takes an undertaking. Well, what if you had someone who had OCD came in, sent a CV into your company and said that they're, they're great at organizing things. And they've got examples, bam, 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 of things that they've organized, but they've got OCD. But that could be exactly the skill that you need that person, that person job description to have because they will, they are planners. 
someone with OCD are fantastic at planning things because they like their ducks in a row. Choose one task, do it, do it well, move on to task two. Don't try and do five tasks at once because you get none of them done. Make lists, prioritize what you need to do, bam, attack it, deal with it, excel at it, go on to the next task. They will be making lists. They will be prioritizing. They will be looking at ways to, to um, smooth the operation. Someone with OCD might be exactly what you want. If you've got a planning situation where you've got to plan 20 people in each of three teams, you would not turn, you would not employ someone just because they have OCD. They might, that OCD might be exactly the characteristic that you need that person to have to do that job well. Employers need to think bigger, need to think differently. How can we support the right candidate so that they work for us doing the right thing, doing the excelling at what they do so that our business is the one that thrives? How can we support that? It's over to you. If you want some support in how to support people, who are new or diverse, please get in touch. So, have a quick drink. Creativity. The ability to think differently, to ask the what-if questions. You want those people in your business. Properly supported, in the right environment. That's what you want. You want the people who are the best, who think differently. Yeah. Yeah. They might have some challenges. We've all got challenges. Some neurotypical people have challenges. They might be suffering from depression. They might be suffering from anxiety. They might be, um, they might have a relative who's sick and they're not on their A game. Well, support them, help them. If they need to take a couple of hours off to go and support that person who's going to have a hospital appointment, you do that. Don't just sit there with a clipboard and a stopwatch. Because not everyone's going to be on their A game every day, all of the time. Understand your teams. Understand how to support them. And if they need to go and take an hour off to go to the dentist, let them do it. Because they'll make up the time. They won't need telling. They'll make up the time because they're diligent employees and they'll need to go and get that done. The alternative is that they take half a day or a day off out of their annual leave and you lose them for a day. Whereas if they got an appointment at half past four and need to leave at four o'clock, you've only lost them for an hour. And they'll probably make up that hour the next day or the day after. Or come in early the following morning. Make up their time. What's the problem? You're supporting them in the right environment. You're, you're allowing them to be their authentic selves and be as efficient as they can be. And if that means you need to let them come in late because they've got a doctor's appointment, so be it. You know, have the conversation. Yeah, I'm going to be late coming in tomorrow morning. I'll make up the time in the afternoon. No problem. Thanks very much for letting me know. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. So don't make bigger issues out of things that really aren't worth the effort. Because if you start to clock watch people because they've had a doctor's appointment or their, their wife's in labor and, you know, labor can take a long time. <laughs> and they labor can take a long time from between waters breaking and the baby being born if you're if you're part if you're if the husband or the boyfriend of, of the, the woman who's pregnant gets a phone call and says oh my waters are broke they're not going to say oh don't worry i'll be there in three or four hours time it never happens that quickly that person's going to get off the phone say right i'll be right there Got the bag ready, get you get the car, and I'll come pick you up and take you to the hospital. You would have had the conversation with your boss and said, Yep, no problem. Let us know when you can come back. Don't worry about us. We'll be fine. We'll cover. So that two days later, when they come in and they're tired and they're shattered and they have not had a shave and they've got the same shirt on that they <laughs> had two days ago, but they've got the photographs on their phone and they, they, they've got a baby. Support them. Because, 
giving them the support to do that means that they will put in the time when needed. They will put in that extra effort on a Friday afternoon when something's got to be done and it's clicking over towards six o'clock rather than five o'clock. If you, you're just a clock watcher with a clipboard going, you're late, you're late, you're late, I'm going to write you up. They're not going to stay to finish that thing. Guarantee you, they will not stay. They'll do it once. They'll do it once and then when they realise they've been taken advantage of, they won't do it again. And that's you lost any goodwill that you're going to have with that employee forever. Or until that manager is moved on or leaves. It's your choice. Have the creative people that can drive your business to the next level. Support them. However challenging their, their situation may be, whatever those things are, reasonable adjustments, you can do that. I challenge you to do it. And if you don't want to do it, let me know. I'd like to know. And we can have a conversation. So that is all I've got for today, talking about creativity and how it can be the absolute thing that will drive your business to be the leader in a few years' time so that you're the leader, you're the trend, you're the one that everyone is chasing. Because if you're the leader and you're the trend, you'll be doing well. You can be, you can have that premium product at a premium price so that you earn well, you get good profits from it, so that you can cascade that down to your staff. Never forget to share the profits that you make with your staff. Yeah, the boardroom have greater responsibility, but if they didn't have people working for them, they'd have nothing. So share the rewards with everyone in your teams. So keep a look out on LinkedIn on Friday afternoon for what next week's topic will be. Don't know yet. I'll be having a think about that for the rest of today and tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So thank you very much for your time. Take care. And if you want to get in touch, it's andrew at aspergersmatters.com or as, at the, as on the uh, screen behind me, you can get in touch with me through my website at aspergersmatters.com. My name's Andrew Marsh. I have Asperger's and I'm here to help you better manage people like me with Asperger's syndrome and autism in the workplace. Take care.